Turn your Bibles, if you would. We're going to be starting in the book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs. So I know I've been out for a couple weeks with the surgery and uh, recovery, so I've got like 10 pages of, of backed up jokes, okay, y'all ready? So get comfortable. No, just a, just a couple. So why aren't there any patriotic knock-knock jokes? Because freedom rings, it doesn't knock. What did the American flag, okay, you have to pay attention, what did the American flag say to the British flag? Nothing, it just waved. It just waved, okay. <laughs> you know you missed them. Amen. Anyhow, in a couple days, our nation is going to celebrate its independence, its freedom. It's freedom from the tyranny of Great Britain. It's freedom from the heavy hand of the uh, Church of England. It's freedom to form a government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's freedom to form and govern this great nation according to to this, according to the word of God. Amen? And as we celebrate this freedom, we also have to be mindful of its enormous cost. Freedom is never free. Let us ever be mindful of the countless patriots that sacrificed, that paid that enormous cost for our freedoms that we enjoy every single day. Amen? How many were persecuted when you came to church today? None of us. How many of us had to put our lives on the line just to enter that church door? None of us. Amen? Let us never forsake the freedoms that we have. Let us never forget the cost. There were 56 brave men that signed the Declaration of Independence. Of those 56 men, five of them were captured and tortured by the British. Twelve had their homes completely burned to the ground. Three lost sons on the battlefield. And nine volunteered to fight, uh, to fight on the very front lines and paid the ultimate sacrifice with their very lives. Thomas McKean, a patriot, he and his family had to uh, constantly run and hide uh, from the British soldiers as they were tracked and hunted day after day. Mr. McKean later served in our nation's very first Congress, without pay, and he died in poverty. Thomas Nelson had his home seized by the British, and, was, and it was used, uh, his home was used by them as a command post. He joined the army, and he urged General George Washington to open fire on it. It was completely destroyed, and he also died penniless. Freedom is never free. Book of Proverbs, let's start reading in chapter 14, skipping down to verse 27. Proverbs 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, to turn one away from the snares of death. In a multitude of people is a king's honor, but in the lack of people is the downfall of a prince. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. The wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a refuge in his death. 
Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding. But what is the heart of fools is made known. Verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Verse 34 is where I want to spend our time this morning. And the first thing I want to see is the first part of that. Righteousness exalts a nation. You know, we think of today, by today's standards, today's worldly standards, the strength of a nation is really based on three premises. The first is a strong economy with the development of resources. You know, today's economy is money equals power. The second premise is a strong education system. And it's not for what you would think it would be. But today, that strong education simply, uh, simply means a way to indoctrinate the next generation. And the third premise in today's uh, worldly standards of a strong nation is a strong, well-trained army. Strong, well-trained military. Now, no doubt on the surface, these are very admirable qualities for a nation. And a nation would certainly be better off with them than without them. However, the Bible and history makes it clear that it's Almighty God that sets up kingdoms. It's Almighty God that allows kingdoms to rise. It's Almighty God that allows kings to sit upon their thrones, world leaders to come into power. And it's Almighty God that brings those kingdoms down. And it's Almighty God that removes those kings from their thrones. Amen? That is truth according to the word of God and truth according to history. The mightiest army, the wealthiest nation, the most educated people are no comparison to Almighty God. Amen? The Bible outlines how God has allowed, you know, many very, very strong, many powerful empires to come to power. You know, we think back in history, we had the, the Persian Empire. We had the mighty Roman Empire. We had the, the mighty Greek Empire. All those great empires came to power. But we also see, likewise, both in the Word of God and in our history books, how quickly those empires were removed from power. Amen? Because it's righteousness towards Almighty God that exalts a nation. Righteousness is a nation's greatest resource. It's not how much gold they have in reserve. It's not how much oil they have underground. It is righteousness that is a nation's greatest resource. That is the only reason, the only way how a ragtag army made up of mostly farmers armed with nothing more than shotguns, how they were able to defeat a massive and mighty British army. Their faith in Almighty God and the God of uh, the angel armies allowed him to lend his almighty hand and deliver their independence. This is why God has blessed this nation for so many years. When the pilgrims set sail across that vast Atlantic Ocean, knowing that many of them would never even make it, when they set sail, it was for one purpose— and that was to seek righteousness in their worship of Almighty God. That's why they left. They wanted freedom to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Our nation's forefathers, when forming our very first government, they fully understood that a nation without God and Jesus Christ was a nation doomed to fall and to fail. 
Patrick Henry, one of our nation's forefathers. He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We shall not fight alone, for God presides over the destinies of nations. The battle is not to the strong alone. President George Washington, in his first inaugural address in 1789, he said it would be peculiarly improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to the Almighty God who rules over the universe, who presides in the council of nation, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect. He said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. He said, without a humble imitation of the character of the divine author of our div uh, uh, blessed religion, Christianity, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Ben Franklin, most of us are familiar with his many, many inventions. Ben Franklin said, I have lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible that an empire can rise without his aid? President James Madison, he said, We have staked the whole of our political institution upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Noah Webster, we're all familiar with the Webster's Dictionary. Noah Webster said, The religion which has introduced civil liberty is the religion of Christ and the apostles. This is genuine Christianity. And to this wise, we owe our free constitutions of government. President Thomas Jefferson, he said, the reason that Christianity is the best friend of government is because Christianity is the only thing that changes the heart. These were the very founding fathers of this great nation. And our founding fathers knew that it is righteousness that exalts a nation. And thus, they formed the greatest Christian nation that has ever been found on the face of this earth, the United States of America. Amen? Secondly, in verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation... Then we see that small three-letter word. That's a transition word, that word but. Sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach to any people. Turn your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Romans, if you would. Romans chapter 1. Now, in the book of Romans chapter 1, God outlines the condemnation of a people. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to the wording because it's a people that very much resemble our nation today. We're going to start reading down at verse 18. Romans chapter 1, skip down to verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What God is saying here is that the invisible God made himself visible how? In all creation. Amen? The invisible God is seen in his very creation. He said, therefore, no one is without excuse. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and and like birds and four-footed animals and creeping things idols. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. America, We need to understand that God's wrath and his very condemnation are on our doorstep. That's something even our founding fathers warned us against. President George Washington, he said, The smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of right and order which heaven itself ordains. President Thomas Jefferson, he said, Can the liberties, the freedoms of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? And that is that a conviction of the minds of the people that these freedoms are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated except by His wrath. Jefferson said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. I don't know about you, but I too tremble for this nation. When I look around and I see how far we have turned against a holy, righteous, and almighty God, When I look around and I see how rampant sin has become and how calloused hearts have become towards Almighty God, what an enemy ungodliness is to a nation. Sin is a reproach to any nation. Whether a nation is lifted up and blessed or whether that nation is brought down in shame, That depends solely on how its people chooses to live in accordance to God's law, 
in accordance to his word or if they choose to live contrary to it. We as a nation, we have turned our backs upon God, his truth, and his word. We resemble what I just read in Romans chapter 1. We have to get back and understand that it is righteousness that exalts a nation. And we have to understand that righteousness is not legislated by government. Amen? Righteousness is spelled out by the word of God, and it must be lived out by his people. As sinners, we can't become righteous. Amen? We can't do good deeds and, and try to be a good person to, to dry, try to become righteous. We can't become righteous. We can only be made righteous but through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For the Father made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen? Freedom is never free. That is true both physically and spiritually. We need to understand that Jesus Christ, that he gave his precious life, that he shed his precious blood for our spiritual freedom. <clears throat> so that we can have freedom over death and hell and a grave and the enemy. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> but God demonstrated his own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We have to understand that freedom is never free. And that Jesus Christ is truly our only hope, individually and nationally. 